here we go. Ox likes this very much. Welcome to Coffee with Coffee, 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 Coffee. Let's do this! And welcome back to Coffee with Toffees, guys. It is December 10th, if you're listening on the podcast. December 9th, if you're here live with me for this interview early taping. My name is Toffees, as always, bringing you the action, bringing you the Dota news that you need to make your day that much better. You can follow me at Toffees underscore Dota 2. You can find me on SoundCloud, YouTube, pretty much anywhere that you want to be. And uh, if you do want to support the show and keep us doing what we're doing, you can go to patreon.com slash Toffees and uh, give us kind words or a dollar of your time whatever works for you to help us stay on the air that said it's going to be a great show today we're going to talk a little bit about some breaking news that just went on and then we are going to have a talk back with the man himself uh, a brand new free agent on the market chris ush usher is joining me how are you doing today sir i'm doing good how are you I cannot complain. I am doing great. So uh, without further ado, we'll get right into the show and start chatting it up. I will say this, though, guys. Uh, Lil Toffee, some of you probably already know, is sick. So if you do hear coughing, yelling, screaming, uh, he's safe. He's alive. He is just not feeling well. So my apologies ahead of time. Now, that said, it's a news show. And normally we have this big news lead up at the start of the show. Yeah, I've seen it. Thank you, Barrett. I hope you like it. You know, It's yeah, not just seeing it passing. It's it's good. No Reddit baits, but uh, I'm not baiting clicks, I promise. No, but uh, normally we do a lot of news. Not a lot of news going on right now. Everybody's sort of flying back from the summit. Starladder was on a break. There wasn't this. There wasn't much going on except uh, a little bit of I League and uh, some smaller tournaments. And I wasn't even planning on doing the news today. I was just going to do this interview with Ush, make it a good one, use that as the podcast uh, because that's really the interesting stuff everyone wants to hear. And then something happened this afternoon, something pretty gosh darn big. And what that is, is Good Game Agency, uh, the guys who own EG and Alliance and then apparently Team Tinker, which was never made official but was announced uh, in an AMA a couple of weeks ago, have now announced that as of 4 p.m. this afternoon, they have sold their company to Twitch and by virtue of that sell to the almighty Amazon. So that was a pretty big piece of news that... Regardless of what I had planned, I had to share with you. Ash, do you have any thoughts or feelings on this news? Mm, well, I didn't even know about it until you told me, so it's kind of interesting. But I'm pretty sure that Good Game Agency is like, as far as far as from what I know, they treat their players really well and mm-hmm. they know what they're doing. So I would be inclined to trust their decision, but I don't really know what it entails right now. So that's all I can really say. But I'm sure it's a good move for them. I just don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, I you know, I agree with that 100%. i got to pause real quick to tell you. We have Ush on the camera today instead of me, and we kind of switched spots. And i got to say I'm loving it because I can actually pick my nose during the show, and no one but <laughs> Ush can see it, so that's phenomenal. But I think this is a good thing. Uh, a lot of folks are on the fence, but there were some implications in the blog that – the players are going to get some new things for the first time. And what that says to me is we might see some things like medical benefits or 401ks or things like that because technically now if you sign a contract with GGA, you are signing a contract to work for Twitch and Amazon, which is a major company that would have to have those things for their employees potentially. So um, there's a, there's a lot of kind of a new base. Like I think the idea of having medical coverage at you know as a professional player exactly like that's a huge benefit. So yeah. this does a couple of things. If that's true, it and this is I can't I can't say this for sure. This is just my understanding of business because I've worked in the business world for a long time. But if that's true. It's a whole new negotiations game because now GGA can go to teams and say not only are we going to give you this contract, but we're going to give you dental and medical as well. And that's that's pretty massive. It seems like GGA is just going to be like the number one option for anybody who would want to sign with the team. Absolutely. Now, keep in mind, some countries uh, have, you know, universal Medicare and things like that. So maybe uh, Arteezy doesn't care so much about having medical included in his contract since he gets that yeah. from Canada. But for the rest of us who are out there huffing it, uh, it's it, it would be a nice benefit. So a lot of interesting size to that. I will follow it throughout the next week or so. 
Uh, but we will definitely keep you guys up to date on exactly what is going on with the whole buyout thing as we get information on it. So that's enough of that. That's just kind of the news you needed to have. We're going to sit down now and we are actually going to chat with Ush about all kinds of stuff. And we're, we're going to focus mostly on where he's been, where he's going, and a lot of the skill-based stuff where I think that you're pro you are one of the best statistically side lane carries in the game right now. We definitely want to talk about that, but we're going to start out in a very Coffee with Toffee standard way, and I want to get some background on you. So okay. let's start with a little bit of background. I know that you're 18, right? And we, we know yep. that you're from New York. If you've ever listened to an interview with us, you know that. But I want to know yep. what part of New York are you from? Are you a New York City type of kid, or are you a little bit country? No, I live in upstate New York. Okay. So I live probably like four or five hours from the city, Okay. like north of the city. And the city I live in is called Syracuse. It's just, it's a pretty big city, but it's like... Uh, Nothing like New York City. I know exactly where it is. I drive through it uh, a couple times a year as I head out to Indiana to see family. So I yep. stayed in Syracuse two weeks ago. Well, no, three or four weeks ago. But uh, uh, that is a small little town. Yeah. Very interesting town, too. I won't go into that, but that's something to talk about on another day. Um, so let me hear about how you got started in video games in general. Now, yeah, just general? tell me how you got started in video games. Yeah, just like the first time you flipped the switch on a video game system. Well... I remember when I was like seven years old or something, I played, well, even before that, when I was like five years old, I played Diablo 2. Mm. I'm pretty sure you know, do you know what that is? I'm of course sure I you do. Probably do. Okay, so yeah, I played Diablo 2 when I was like five, and then I actually played Diablo 2 until I was probably about 14. Wow. So for like nine years, but I never, I was never like, I never knew anything about competitive gaming, though. I right. always just... I was just like, my brothers played games, and they're both older than me, so I just kind of followed in their footsteps. If they played a game, I probably played it, so I played, like, Halo and, like, Diablo 2. Mm. I played some Warcraft 3. Like, I played, um, I never played Dota, though, in Warcraft 3. I mm -hmm. played, like, you know, the random custom games, like Winter Mall, that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. And then, I'm sure most people are interested in how I got into Dota, so... The Dota story? Well, I guess you're going to be asking me something about that later. No, tell me about the Dota think. story. Just go for it. Why not? So, well, I got seven concussions. from Seven? Yep, seven. Wow. And two, I got, my first two were in, from football. Got it. Like, five years ago. And then, once you get a couple concussions, the next ones come easier and easier. Yep. So I ended up getting seven total. And then, that kind of caused me to, like... You know, I I stopped going to school mm -hmm. and and all that kind of stuff. So like I had all this free time, and then I started playing Dota, and I played so I played Dota one for about five months or six months, something like that. And then Dota two came out, so I switched to that immediately because some someone gave me the beta key, and then yeah. I was like, well, I didn't actually like Dota one. I thought it was like a pretty bad game to be mm -hmm. honest. Because I didn't play it for long enough, so I didn't have, like, the nostalgia factor and stuff. Right. So I thought it was just, like, a bad engine, you know, bad game. It was, like, it had inherent, like, ping issues and stuff. Mm -hmm. And then when Dota 2 came out, I actually, like, fell in love with it right away. Because it was, like, Dota 1, but way better. So I've been playing Dota for about three years now, I think. And that's the story of why I actually played Dota. Nice. That's good. I understand completely. I have actually, uh... I had three concussions in a row. Last one had hemorrhaging, and that's why I went to video games as well. So oh, a nice. good answer. Interesting. Very interesting. And I, the next question I had on the list for you guys who uh, don't know or don't know why he uh, tried to pause is that I. it seems to me like you're a guy who's very concerned with fitness. And a lot of your interviews – in fact, I think the interview you did for Join Dota, you made, a, you made it, it clear uh, to Jessica that the team actually made time for you to get to go to the gym in between yeah. practices. So is that from working or, or being an athlete or a sports person your, your whole life? Or are you just – why do you like the gym so much? Well, I've been going to the gym for like 13 months now, hmm. consistently anyways. I went I went before that, but I was like on and off, didn't really mm -hmm. care. But um, after I got the concussions, I had to quit playing sports. I played baseball, basketball, and football. So I was like – I was naturally athletic. I really mm -hmm. liked sports. Which is also why I think I like playing Dota, because mm. in the competitive sense, like sports are really competitive too. And I really, not only was I athletic, but I was super competitive. I've always been super competitive. So when I had to quit sports, uh, 
I kind of took over the fitness aspect from sports mm -hmm. by going to the gym, and then the competitive aspect I get from Dota. So it's kind of like a transition from playing sports as a kid to now doing this. That's so funny. It, it, it makes sense, and I think it's it's funny when you say transition from playing sports as a kid to doing this. Um, yeah. Well, I play on a I play on an amateur team with a bunch of thirty year old guys that we should rename our team Too Fat to Play Real Sports, <laughs> and that's why we started doing this. So it's funny to hear you say that. Um, and that's exactly right. It does have that sort of competitive vibe, teamwork sort of thing. So yeah. when you've played on a lot of teams, and this is kind of a, a caveat question, do you meet a lot of other players who have the same sort of competitive sports background that gets them into Dota? Or do you tend to play with a lot of people who haven't really been athletes in the past? Uh, or is well, as, far as, as far as my last team, not, I don't think any of them played played like sports like if they did i mean i don't know for sure when they were younger but if they did i don't think they would have been, they were very serious about it because mm -hmm. i remember when i played sports back when i was younger maybe like 14 and even younger than that i was like one of those kids that played sports but i was like super serious mm -hmm. even though like everyone was like it's all about having fun it's all about having fun i always wanted to win so i was like really really into sports when i was younger but i don't think most dota players i've met really played sports or like were athletic or were interested in that which is probably why you know they play games they're inside all the time you know i don't know but i haven't really met anyone that like shared that with me though yeah it's interesting it's one of those things where i always wonder if dota had more coaches who acted like the coaches that we had on the soccer or the football field when we were 12 and 13 if the teams would be a little more synergetic or have less of these sort of come and go issues that we've seen lately but that's a uh, discussion for another time yeah. uh you said in the interview with emil davi or jessica over on join dota that your parents didn't buy into the whole esports thing um that was almost a year ago has that changed at all yeah that definitely changed i yeah that interview must have been a long time ago then mm -hmm. right it was so... it was right after sna sort of burst onto the scene yeah 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 so after well i, I only lived with my, lived with my dad so, I mean, I obviously talk to my mom, but it's mostly, like, um, my dad, um, you know, agreeing with it or going along with it that would be the most important for me. Or, like, at least accepting that I do it, because obviously I live with him. I need to, like, you know, I need to do what he wants me to do, obviously, kind of. Right. Not completely, but you know what I'm saying. Absolutely. And after I went to ESL New York, which was in October, and then... After, right after we went there, I was also going to Romania for DreamHack Bucharest. So after I went to like, I went to two lands in one month, and then wow. um, I actually made a lot of money that month. And my dad saw it and was like, "Well, he kind of saw the potential in it, and he saw he he always knew how much I cared about it, but he just is a kind of realistic type of person. He knew I cared a lot about it, but before I was doing anything with it, he was kind of like." Eh, I don't know about this, but after I made some money and I was traveling and doing mm -hmm. things that I like to do, he was he's pretty much supportive of it now. That's awesome. So yeah, you did so you did well on those two tournaments. That's excellent to hear. Um, have you do you get to travel a lot, or was that sort of the first time you got to go outside of the country? Well, ESL was the first time I was ever on a plane. Really? So, yeah, it was the first time flying for me. But I, I mean, I've traveled, but yeah just to like other states you know not out of the country i've been to canada but that doesn't really count no it doesn't so not not out of the country other than canada really so that's pretty cool so how was that was that a pretty good adventure for you like i i, I mean it's the first time you left the country and you're doing it as a pro video game player yeah. how did you feel about surreal. it <laughs> right yeah that's it was like esl was really it was my first LAN, which was really good for me because uh, ESL was in New York City and I live in New York so the flight was like 45 minutes mm -hmm. so it was like it was a good way for me to get introduced into traveling and becoming a pro player like I only had to travel for like one hour you know and then I'm there so it was like it wasn't like I had to go through all these travel mm -hmm. nightmares for my first time you know so it was really good for me to get like used to the traveling used to like everything about lands how they set it up for you and stuff like that but Romania was kind of a disaster. Yeah? Like, the travel was terrible. Hmm. I had... So, going to Romania, I had a seven-hour layover in JFK, which is in New York City. Right. And then... Well, actually, the, the real disaster was on the way back. So, on the way back, I missed my flight. So, I had to buy new flights, which was, like, 
four hundred dollars or something. Wow. But I mean, it was completely my fault. But I missed the flight. I was like late, mm. so. But, and then after that, I got a flight to Germany from Romania, and then that flight got delayed by three hours, oh. causing me to miss my next flight. So then I had to stay in Germany overnight because I missed my flight to America, and then I had to stay overnight and then get a new flight to America the next day. Wow. It was just, it was like a whole two days of traveling. It was terrible. So not only did you get to have your first overseas flying experience as a pro, you got to have your first <laughs> terrible flying experience as well. So you really yeah, got it all. Nightmare. You got a lifetime of travel into those couple of moments. Let me ask you this. When you go to these lands, what equipment, not like what clothes and stuff, but like what actual computer equipment do you have to take with you? Uh, it's pretty simple. You just bring your mouse pad, your mouse, your keyboard, and your headset. That's it. And earbuds too. You need earbuds. Okay. That's pretty much, yeah, you don't bring anything else. Nice. That's so all you, you need. So you do bring, so basically if, it's, if it plugs into your computer and it's not a webcam, yeah, pretty much. you take it with you. Yeah, Excellent. pretty much. Does anybody, is there anybody you've seen at the tournaments that brings something really strange? Or you're like, man, that seems like a lot to bring with you. Mm, no, actually, because I remember when I was going to ESL, my first LAN, and I, I was like talking to Mike, like I was super like, nervous about going like, i didn't know i always kept asking like do i gotta bring this do i gotta bring that like what mm -hmm. i'm gonna forget stuff and he's like going to lands is really easy you just bring your computer stuff and you bring some clothes and that's it and it's nice. like it, and after i did it i realized like it really was extremely simple like nice. it wasn't hard at all like obviously kids my age can do it it's not that hard <laughs> so easy kids your age could do it with yeah. a little help from mike the uh the mentor so yep. let me ask you about this tell me about the moment when it clicked in your head and you said to yourself i could do this i could go pro and make a living being a gamer well i think the best moment was when we qualified for esl because mm -hmm. I had always like dreamed of going to a land like I remember telling Mike like three months before that like I want to go to a land so badly I want to go to a land so badly and like we would come close so many times but we yeah. would just lose every time like in the finals or something like we didn't go to Taiwan which was for MSI because mm -hmm. we had like some things go wrong like I couldn't play and then like Mike couldn't Mike got like DDoS or something he couldn't mm -hmm. play so we didn't qualify for that and then like uh, Star Ladder we we went 2-2 two, two, two with EG, then we lost 3-2. Like, we always came really close, but we never made it to a uh, LAN. And then when we qualified for ESL, it was, like, actually such a good feeling. Like, I, I knew after we won, we were going to go to a LAN, and it was, like, going to LANs is basically, like, the dream because right. it's, like, the best possible scenario to play Dota. And it's also, like, you know, obviously where you can make tons of money as well. Mm -hmm. So... Probably some, probably that was the best moment for me. And when I knew, like, because after I went to a LAN, it was like addicting. I want to go to more right. and more and more. So, yeah. So when you were there at ESL and at DreamHack, did people recognize you as you walked around? Was it sort of like, hey, there's us. <laughs> Can you sign something for me? Or were you still pretty under the radar and not so many folks talked to you? Actually, it was kind of awkward because when at ESL, my first LAN, I was always with Mike because. I don't know if people know this, but when I was on SNOM, Mike was like my best friend in like in Dota at period, like just online in general, Mike was like my best friend. And um, so I would walk around with Mike the whole event and like people, you know, Mike is super famous, like right. tons of people came up to Mike asking him for pictures and sign his stuff. And like, actually some people did know me and some people came up to me first even though i was with mike which is kind of cool but most of the time it was like people go up to mike and then they'd see me and they'd be like oh you're us right and then <laughs> i would like i would like sign something for them or take a picture of them but it was like most people knew me but not really it's got to be kind of surreal though like do you remember the feeling when you got asked for your first autograph yeah i actually do it was like it's kind of a, a crazy feeling it's like I can't believe this person actually wants to take a picture with me or actually wants me their, my autograph. Like, why do they want my autograph? <laughs> That's awesome. So that sort of brings us up to the Sneaky Nicks Assassin's history. Uh, you, you were a founding member of the original SNA before it was even Sneaky Nicks Assassin's. I remember seeing you guys a lot at, like, the SECS or the TECS. Um, almost felt like sort of 
pubbing together to try it out as a team, it felt like. Um, yeah. First, before I get into asking questions about the formation, I have to ask you this, because it was a joke that we ran for mm -hmm. a very long time in the tournament, and it was that SNA, the actual player, put you guys together because he had to pay for his dial-up modem with SCCS <laughs> winning money. Did he actually play on dial-up, or is that just a fallacy? Um, let me see. I think I don't I don't remember what internet he has, but I know it's like his internet is terrible. Yeah. Like, I remember like sometimes, you know, during SECS or TECS or whatever, like there would be a patch and like I think TECS in specific, th yep. it was on patch day, right? I remember that. Yep. Yeah, and and it, if there was a patch, like a big patch, we just like we were like, okay, we're just going to go AFK for an hour cuz mm -hmm. Snaz patch literally would take over an hour. To, to download like we knew it was coming no matter what and like so we would literally have to take like an hour and a half break just for snot to download the patch i actually think i remember one of those games where it was i i think all of us downloaded in about eight minutes and then an hour and 10 minutes later sna was ready to play so <laughs> that was a pretty fond of memories and that's sort of when you guys started to get together um when did you guys decide to take sna from a semi-pro let's have some fun and make a hundred bucks on a thursday night team to the mainstream and actually go out there and start to actively look for tournaments? Um, I'm pretty sure it was when Fluff joined. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I remember around the time that Fluff got released from Liquid, mm -hmm. um, we immediately, like, Mike has always been really good friends with him, so we mm -hmm. immediately talked to Fluff, and then Mike, Mike asked Fluff if he may, might want to play with us, and actually I was... Back then, I was actually extremely surprised. Like, Fluff wanted to play with us really badly. And I was like, at that time, I was like, kind of not known at all. I w we weren't a good team at all. And like, when I heard like a player from Liquid would want to play with us, I was like, I actually got extremely excited. <laughs> and then when Fluff joined and like kind of took over a bit, mm -hmm. it kind of inspired the whole team to like nice. improve and stuff. And like, and actually be a serious team. Because like we had a the captain of Liquid join us, yeah. So it was kind of a a good. It was a really good thing for us. Well, and it sort of came on. It was a little bit of a separation, but a little bit after the heels of his his open letter of I want to step up and take a bigger leadership role with Liquid, and for some reason the synergy didn't work out there, and you know we, I've never really found out why. But do you think that that sort of played into the success you guys had? Because right after he joined and took over the drafting and leadership role, you guys had some really good runs and some really great performances. Did that sort of desire to lead and excitement on your guys' part to have such a, I guess, famous North American pro come on board lead to that success? Or do you think it was just you followed the same recipe you had all along? No, I think when Fluff joined, he taught... I mean, maybe not Mike, but he taught mm -hmm. me and Sna. And I think we had Whitebeard at the time, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm pretty yeah. sure. I have a trouble remembering all these specifics, but right. Fluff basically like he did take over and he started captaining and he taught all of our players like a lot. And he like not only did he teach us like in game and like how to play at a high level and like how to what how you need to play when you're competing against really good teams, mm -hmm. but he also taught us like you know how to be a professional player just in general like waking up for scrims, playing a lot of games, practicing all the time, like how to have a good uh, mentality for the game. Like, uh, he taught all of us a lot, and I think he also motivated us to like, because before it was, we we all dreamed of being a good team, but it was kind of like, we knew we weren't great, so we just played for fun and saw where it would take us. But when Fluff joined it, and then we also got an invite to the TI qualifiers, we kind of like saw it as, maybe we can actually be a really good team. So it changed a lot. That's awesome. And you guys uh, were, like we said, insanely successful out of the gate, and then the roster changes sort of started to happen. We worked our way up into the qualifiers for TI, then you had some good success after that. Uh, the first change, I think, was Whitebeard's departure after the TI qualifiers, uh, which I, I think we already know a little bit about what happened there, some issues with... Uh, was it he didn't want to go as hardcore pro or was it a little bit of he gets hardcore when the game's going on mm. if you don't want to get into specifics we can just move on past that well i don't i mean i feel like i don't want to get into the drama but at the same time i should man up and accept responsibility okay because if, if it was if it was like you know 
a controversy between him and another player on the team, I probably wouldn't talk about it. But since right. it was me, I um, think I'm okay with talking about it. So, I mean, I I basically said that I didn't want to play with it. This is what it came down to. I said that it was me or him, basically. Mm. I I just I don't want to talk about why, because right now, right. like as of today, after playing with him again, I respect him a lot, and we made up, and we like I apologized to him and everything. We're good now, but at that time when I was more immature and didn't know as much as I know now, I kind of just said I don't want to play with him, mm -hmm. and it's like me or him, and what ended up happening was, like, I stayed. So yeah. he basically just kind of got, you know... It's it's sad to say, but that's how it went. So. Well, and it's it's a, it's a game where you guys... I mean, I, SNA was training a lot at that point, right? You guys were practicing and scrimming, and it's sort of like living with someone in a lot of ways as you spend all your time together in a very tense... It's not like a sporting event on Sunday where you play a football game and then you're fine for a week and you practice and everybody's good because you're playing multiple games per day. So it can be a very stressful environment. So that's interesting. Then the changes kind of kept coming. Uh, there was a point where people started calling SNA or the Sneaky Knicks Assassins like Liquid 2.0. Because it was essentially like U plus Liquid, if I remember correctly. Um, yeah, pretty much. And Mike as well. But he was also on Liquid a long yeah, time. Yeah, I think that's why the joke was. Because it was like Liquid yeah, kind of yeah. grabbed Mike back. And we're like, all right, Ush, you come too. And yeah. let's reboot Liquid. Um, do you feel like that was sort of a beginning of a divide for us, Sneaky Nicks? Or do you think that that gave you guys a bump to the next level? So you're talking about when we got Wait 2 and TC, right? Yes. Um, I think that that team actually could have been really really good mm -hmm. i can't i mean i don't want to get into specifics why it failed or like why everything went wrong but i think like it some things went really wrong at the beginning of it which mm -hmm. made everyone think it was like there was no potential it was gonna fail and then like it kind of fell apart but from my point of view like that team could have been really really good yeah so i don't know it happens but it does and i i mean and, and i'm agreeing with i'm agreeing with you 100 percent because if you uh you can go back to like tecs secs days when like gorgon and i were covering almost all of your games because you were still small enough that we could actually get coverage for you guys <laughs> um and every single game was like yes this is the next north american up-and-coming team and you guys really pushed that for a while and then it sort of seemed like there was a lull that ultimately resulted in you departing from Sneaky Nicks Assassins and going over to Navi US. And every, people who posted on Reddit wanted to know, Twitter wants to know, what sort of prompted the move from SNA, who was a respectable, successful North American team, to Navi US, which honestly was performing about the same at the time? Well, there was a, there was a lot of reasons, obviously. Mm -hmm. And... When I look back on it, I'm pretty sure it was a mistake, but at the same time, you know, when you make mistakes, you learn a lot. Right. So I've learned a lot in the past month or so from making that mistake. But the reason why I left, well, one of the reasons why I left is like, I felt that the team wasn't going to make it long term mm -hmm. and I wanted something that would be long term and I wanted a team that would, you know, make it to TI and I, I wanted to play and be in it knowing that we'll be there for the long term and we'll be really good. Mm -hmm. And I don't, for some reason, I just didn't feel it with that team. And also, there was other conflicts like um, I had different ideas on practicing, different mm -hmm. ideas on what you need to be doing as a team. And not to say any names, but some people weren't happy with my, with my uh, dedication or whatever. Gotcha. So... Yeah, I mean, I thought it would be better if I just left the team and they would be better off without me. Mm -hmm. And I also thought that going to Navi would be a good move for me, but I didn't, like, looking back on it, I didn't, like, you know, I didn't look into it enough. I didn't think about it enough. I kind of just went, you know, did everything based on emotions, which is obviously the wrong way to go about it. Like, I, I was, like, I went based on feeling completely, mm -hmm. like, how I felt things would go and how I felt it was going to be but like little did I know like when I joined Navi US they don't even have a team you know like their team's mm -hmm. like kind of dysfunctional they don't even have a real five players and then and then it just fell apart and now I don't even have a team so it's like it was obviously the wrong decision but 
now that I think about it, if I had stayed, it wouldn't really have been fair either, even though that's what I would have wanted now. Because mm -hmm. if I had stayed but not really want to be there, it would just be hurting the team, and that's also selfish. So it's probably right. for the best that I did leave. So you said in an interview with the in an interview with Join Dota that um, when you were asked how SNA had such good synergy at the time when you were all playing together uh, right after the sort of uh, modified team group, you said it was because we're all such good friends. Is that still the case? Has there been some tension growth because of the schism in the team? Or uh, do you think that leaving has actually been better for maintaining the friendship in the long run? Uh, I don't think leaving really had an effect on okay. the friendship. But, I mean, I can confirm what I did say. Like like I said, I'm, I was best friends with Mike. I mean... Yeah. I don't talk to him as much now, obviously, because we're not on a team together, but I still consider him a really, really good friend. Mm -hmm. Fluff is also a really, really good friend of mine. TC, I didn't play with him for long enough to grow a really good relationship, but me and TC, it's like, we we like each other. We're mm -hmm. friends, but we just not like, I'm just not super close with him like the other two. And with Whitebeard, I mean, like I told you before, I apologized, and yeah. we're not, not like, you know, friends, but <laughs> we're, we're, we're fine, you know. But yeah, I'm. I have good relationship with all of them. I think. Good. That's good to hear. Um, so when you guys switched this, or when you went to Navi US, this really interesting thing happened, and it's that Brax, the member of Navi US who was sort of not fitting with the team, then kind of took your spot on Sneaky Nick's Assassins. Did, was that actually a prearranged trade, or did it just sort of happen to work out that way? No, I think. So the, when I decided to leave, mm -hmm. it was like a little bit before we went to DreamHack Bucharest, which was, I think, the beginning of November. So a little bit before the beginning of November is when I decided to leave. Mm -hmm. I think, anyways, I can't remember perfectly, but um, it definitely wasn't a pre-planned trade. My understanding of the situation was that I didn't want to play anymore. I wanted to go. I wanted to try something new mm -hmm. and leave and play with Navi, and then. My understanding of the situation was that SNA probably wouldn't be a team anymore. Mm. But like a little bit after DreamHack ended and I was playing with Navi, I saw um, well actually even before that, they were playing with Brax, so I saw that they were they were actually sticking together mm -hmm. and they just picked up Brax cuz I knew Fluff was friends with Brax, so it was probably something where like when I left they wanted a new player so fluff went to him first it was probably mm -hmm. something like that yep. but it's not like you know they wanted me out so they could get Brax. it wasn't anything like that did it so i in fact i think it, i don't know if it was a star ladder game or what it was but we actually so right after brax left navi he did an interview with the show and uh ended up joining i think you joined navi like two days after the interview and brax joined SNA like a couple of days after that and then you faced off and I think it was a star ladder match oh, yeah. SNA versus Navi US yeah, was wow. there like sort of a grudge match vibe going on on the on the on your uh, Skype chats or was everybody sort of like business as usual it was just business but uh, I took it I took it pretty personally when I lost like I, I, I not to say I was going in like oh I'm gonna crush my old team I hate them it wasn't anything like that it was just like when I left that team and then and then I, I lose to them like a day later. Mm -hmm. It was like a really, cra it was just a bad feeling, honestly. Yeah. Like, we didn't even like like they beat us pretty badly. And like I, and once I left, I realized how good the team actually was. You know, mm -hmm. like when I was in the team and I had all these bad emotions and like feeling negative about the team, it was obvious that I would think the team wasn't great. But when you step back and look at it objectively, like I I realized how good the players were, how good the team was together. Yeah. And then I was like, oh, well, I don't I, Why did I leave? You know? Yeah. But. No, I, mean, I won't lie to you. Your synergy was phenomenal. As somebody who watches a lot of Dota, I was always uh, blown away by how, especially your support heroes, could just read each other's minds without. Uh, I don't. I, I was never on Skype, but it sounded. It seemed like they didn't talk much, but still knew exactly what the other person was thinking. And it was like watching a ballet. Um, now, did you ever officially sign with Navi, or were you sort of like living the life of a stand in? Uh, I was just a stand in. Like, I was, well, not to get into all of it, but I was thinking about signing, mm -hmm. but everything happened too quickly where, like, mm. it, like it, just, just over a matter of about a week, we didn't have a team anymore, and then we only had three players, so 
there was no point in me signing if we don't even have a team and we're not even playing in tournaments. Right. Because why would they want to sign me if we don't even have a team? But I think when when we did have five players, that was probably the plan. Mm -hmm. But it never ended up happening. So, what is... And let me... I, I, a couple of different questions. Um, first, so Navi offered you a contract then? Did they actually come to you and say, we'd like to contract you onto this team if you want to go forward with it? Mm, no, they didn't. I don't think they ever like asked me mm. to to sign, but I think that it was going to happen if we actually had a team. I right. was going to end up signing, and like we would have played together because they already had a contract with the other players. Mm -hmm. So I would just kind of join with that, I believe. Yeah. But we didn't play together long enough for me to even get a chance to talk to everybody, figure out all this, the details and anything like that. Like, I was just beginning, and then it already fell apart. So so the first game that you played with Navi US, was there, were there any feelings or emotions attached to seeing the Navi logo above your name for the first time? Like, when you went to the lobby and you saw the replay going on, you're like, that screen says I play for Navi. Actually, yeah, to be honest, which is kind of funny, because one of the... I think one of the reasons why I did join, which is like really bad foresight, I mean, really just immature, I think, is like I saw that, that Navi tag and I saw mm. the players playing under the Navi tag and I was like, man, I want to play with those guys. Like, mm. that's awesome. But then, like, and then I, and then once I started playing, I realized, like, it is, it is amazing, you know, to have a team like that and play under a team like that. But if it's not even like a, a, a successful team, if you're not even like five players, it really doesn't mean anything. But I do want that feeling again, where like I have an actual team and we're under a good brand and like I'm actually representing it and I, I know I have a good team, you know. That's awesome. So tell us about being a stand-in. Um, you know, we as fans get don't hear very little about how the kind of pro level contracts work and all that stuff. You know, how does being a stand in work? It, do you get paid for that, or is it all volunteer? Like, what's it like being a stand in? Well, you don't get paid. I can tell you that. <laughs> I mean, basically, I think the idea of a stand in is like, since obviously you're a stand in for a team, the mm -hmm. players that are already signed with the team they obviously get all the benefits of being with the team and they're on the team and even though you're playing with them you don't get that as well but i think the point is is that you're standing in with them so if they if the players want to keep you mm. then the players can basically say like hey I, this stand in worked out i want to play with this person long term and then eventually you would end up signing with the team and then it would work like that but like i said it didn't last long enough for me to get to that point but i think that's how it would have progressed like because I know at that time they, Fogged really wanted to play with me, so mm. I I I was a stand-in, like, as far as you know, not being signed and as far as like, mm -hmm. how it would work. But I was basically on the team, like I wasn't just I wasn't a stand-in, like they were trying me out. Right. I was actually going to join the team. So, is it? <laughs> I don't know if you've actually thought about this. Maybe we shouldn't bring it up. But does it does it hurt or annoy a little bit? So during that period of time that you were a stand-in who was pretty much part of Navi US, Brax, who took your spot on SNA, was getting paid for each game that you played with Navi because he was still technically under contract. I mean, I don't really care, okay. to be honest. It doesn't, it doesn't bother me at all, but... Um, I mean, I don't really care about the, the money part of it. Okay. The, the thing I care about more is, like being a professional in terms of like i want to be on a team of five people that are all dedicated i want to have a sponsor i want to like represent a brand you know i want to be a professional and like be treated as such and like be thought of as that but i don't i mean it's not because i want the money it's because i want to i want to be on that tier or however you want to call it right okay excellent um uh, so moving forward navi like you said never really seemed to get their stride back uh, after the sort of whatever interpersonal issues happen there. And if you guys want to know what happened, you can go back and watch the previous show. Brax pretty much lays it all out there uh, for what happened prior to the him and Theban's departure from the team. Uh, what was it like to try to rebuild? The Sorry, guys, if I got too loud there, I got a little bit excited. Uh, what was it like to try to rebuild a team or work with a team that was in the rebuilding phase? Um, well, when I joined, it was 
Fog, Korok, and Snake King, and they were all signed on Navi, mm -hmm. so they were all part of Navi. So it was Fog, Korok, and Snake King, and then Wei Tzu and me were stand-ins. And then, let's see what happened. We, we, we were playing, so it was basically like, it was basically like we had four players. Fog, Korok, Snake King, and me, and then Wei Tzu was like, we were trying him out, or they were trying him out, and then I joined. So, we were basically only trying to look for one player, and mm -hmm. Wei Tzu was a good fit, I feel. Mm -hmm. I think Wei Tzu's a really good player and he's really smart, but well, what ended up happening was Snake King was not on the team anymore. I don't know if I should get into that. And I mean, then so it's up to you if you want to get into it. I'm sure we'd love to listen, but you don't have to. Uh, I don't think I'd rather not get into that right now. Right. But but it, so it was like it was me. It was Korok, Fog, Wei Tzu, and, and me at that point. And then we started playing with Arise, and then. That didn't work out either, and that's what I ended up... Hmm. Not because of Arise completely, but I'm just saying, at, after that that five players, mm -hmm. it was kind of just a disaster at that point, because Arise stopped playing, and then after Arise stopped playing, way too stopped playing. Mm. Not con completely connected, but that's just how it ended up working out. Right. And then it was down to Korok, Fog, and me. And when you're three players looking for two, like you're not just looking for one anymore, you're looking for two, it's extremely difficult, because not only do you need to find two people in the specific roles but you need to find two people that can both stay and will both work and then like maybe you find one but then you still need another and then what if that one doesn't work with the new one you got it's like really right. really hard really complicated it's like it's it's hard to form a team that way really hard especially that, with the limited pool of players that aren't on teams right now as well yeah it's uh, a lot of the best players have really been snapped up by teams lately which is why you know it'll surprise me if you stay independent for very long um but let's move on to uh, Navi, Navi US. So you did your time with them. It didn't go that great. And uh, last week, Navi US was released from Navi. So the team is no longer signed with Natus Vincir. Will you guys be staying together? Are you going to all be going free agent? Like, are the three of you actively looking together? Or what's the kind of... How's that working? Um, I think the plan right after we disbanded not the announcement obviously but right. the the point after way to arise were gone i think the initial plan was we would just look for plus two and we would just try and find two more players that we can we can play with and we'll try them out and see if it works but i mean like i said before how hard it is as well as the fact that like we couldn't find anybody that was gonna fit like mm -hmm. everyone everyone that we co collectively wanted to play with was already on a team or was like not available to play or something right. like that so we kind of came to the realization that we're just going to have to take a break and mm -hmm. wait for an opportunity to present itself because it wasn't worth all that effort when we knew it wasn't gonna it wasn't gonna work out so we're basically i think we're just all taking a break and let's say for example fog gets asked to play for a team and they just need one player I told him already. I told Fog. I told him like I want to play with you really badly, but if 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 you have an opportunity, you should just take it, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's basically like it's sort of like every man for himself, but we would probably prefer to play with each other. I think okay. that's kind of how it is. Excellent. So you guys still have a good relationship, and I will say this: that Twitch chat is pushing me to try and get you to tell us what happened with Snake King. Uh, so I have to. Can I simply ask if he chose to go on his own way, or if it was something where there was just the synergy wasn't mixing with the new lineups? Well, I think it's fair to to tell the truth that he was kicked. Okay. He didn't leave. He was kicked. Okay. I think it's fair to fair to say that because that's the truth. I'm not going to say why, but basically, the general consensus was that it wasn't working with him. Mm -hmm. Without getting into all the details, and we said it was basically like. We came to a decision together that we wanted him off the team. That's pretty much it. But Fair but enough. to clear up, because I do see a lot of people saying like, "Oh, Snake King left the team because you guys were bad," or right. the, team, the team was bad, so Snake King left. I mean, that's just not true, though. So so on the record, it wasn't he didn't leave because they weren't doing well. He left because you guys sort of had a state of the union: can we survive with this roster? Yeah. And it just wasn't going to work. Um, and I mean, and I think that a lot of folks know that even if it goes around, I know that Brax was on the show talking about how it was just really tough to maintain that relationship, um, on the team. So 
that's good to know. That's good information. We won't go any more into it. Uh, Twitch got their blood, and uh, we'll leave it at that. So we won't go into a shark pit. Uh, what? So we've talked about your plans moving forward a little bit. Before we do, oh no, let me ask this. So your plans for moving forward? Are you planning? It sounds. I was going to ask if you're planning on hanging up the gloves because I think I got a tweet from you or a message from you like a month ago that was like, "I'm done. This this game sucks." Uh, or and you, I think it was just frustration over kind of the losing thing. Are you 100% committed to going going big time with this? Well, I remember at one point after the team disbanded mm -hmm. when I realized that we weren't going to have a team for a long time. Like after the point when I realized that rebuilding wasn't an option and we would yeah. have to take a break, I was like extremely upset because not only did I not have a team, but also... I left my best chance of a team, which was Snow, right. and I could have just, like, if nothing had happened, I could have just been still playing with them, you know, and everything would have been okay, but not only did I leave, but I left, and not only did, like, if I had left to Navi, and, and, and Navi was an actual team, but we just weren't that great, right. I would have been okay with it, because we could have a team, we could improve, we could get better, and, and I, I could trust in that, but hmm. not only did I leave a team that was good, but I didn't have one anymore, so it was like, well, I pretty much just screwed myself over completely, and I was like, I wasn't like, I was upset at myself, right. not like at the game or not at the situation. It was like at my own fault. And mm. I know it's, I know it's my own fault. So I was really in a bad point at that time. But now, after, I mean, I've had a long time to think about it. I'm yeah. like extremely motivated now good. to play. I'm glad to hear that because you're damn good, and you should be motivated to play. <laughs> in fact. I don't know if our fans know this, but we're going to read it to you. Uh, Phage over at High Ground actually sent me some numbers. And if you guys are interested, by the way, we'll do this right now. Um, Ash is going to be on with HGTV. Phage guy and uh, Gerg are going to do an interview with him as well. Um, and Phage is going to do a lot of talk about numbers and just sort of how good Ush actually is. But what I wanted to bring up is, a lot of you may not know, Ush is currently fifth place for best average gpm out of any pro player that means Not if you do a stack, right now. exactly if you do a <laughs> stack chart he's number five on average gpm and that's impressive it's more impressive in my opinion uh because you have been playing lately with teams that don't have necessarily the best winning percentages um against some of the other pros who are on the top five on that list and you're still up there which means that you're able to find space and you're able to get farm even when there's no farm to be had so that's pretty cool uh i just want to make sure that the in viewers knew just how how good you are because you were recently uh nominated to two categories for the two? for the jd awards right you uh i believe it's best up and comer or best newcomer to the scene and best side lane carry so i don't even know about the second one i only know about the newcomer one i didn't see the other one well you sir are nominated for best side lane carry and i think wow. when you're number five on the gpm meter that's a that's a no-brainer to make that nomination so that's pretty good now let me ask you this is all of this skill practiced or is it just natural like you woke up morning and were like damn i'm good at farming i think well there's a lot of reasons like a lot of people Know, that know I've only been playing for three years ask me like because mm -hmm. every other pro player that you see basically has played for like four five right. even like eight nine years so a lot of people ask me like how I improved so quickly like there's a lot of reasons but when I first started playing uh, someone named Tenbird taught me taught me like from a from a pub level and semi semi competitive level, he taught me a lot. Like he taught me so many things about Dota. Obviously, a lot of the things didn't like translate into professional Dota because this was like two years ago, and he wasn't even a professional player. But he like he got me he got me interested in the competitive scene. He got me he taught me like a lot of basics, even more than basics as well. Like he just basically taught me a lot and inspired me to play competitive as well. And then from there. I started playing like leagues. I played like 12 hours a day solo queue hmm, and wow. it combined with leagues. So for like a year long period, I probably played like 15 hours a day every day because like I said, I wasn't in school, Right. which is the reason why I started playing in the first place. So I really had nothing to do and I just played all day long and like, cause I loved the game so much. And uh, basically I just, 
for a year, I just fiended, played mm -hmm. tons of games, like mindless pretty much. And then after that year, I started to realize like, okay, I've played so many games. Like there's not much more, you know, individual practice I need. Like I, I need to start like learning about, you know, strategy and right. like learning about the pro scene and learning about how to actually play as a competitive player because like you can see all these pub players that are extremely good mechanically but mm -hmm. if you throw them into a pro game they're not gonna perform you know so right. i got to that point where i needed to actually learn how to play in a professional game and that's when i started playing on teams and started scrimming and playing tournaments and then that's what got me understanding of the my understanding of like the competitive scene so and those two things combined you know so to that end what is your your training when you started was basically saturation play all the time yeah. pub all the time what does yeah. your training look like now how do you continue to get better now that you're at this level um well recently i've been watching i've been watching like well since i don't play competitive right now obviously i've been watching like replays of myself when I did play, like I'm watching SNA replays and player perspectiving myself, mm -hmm. and I've always watched pro games. Like the Summit, I watched almost every single game. Like, and not just the Summit, obviously. Like for the past year, I've, mm -hmm. well, not the year, but I've always loved watching pro games. And like, I'll just watch um, a carry player that I respect in player perspective and just see how they play the heroes that I like to play mm -hmm. and like how they play in my role and just see like. What, what what are they doing that I that I wouldn't be doing or what would I do that they aren't doing and and compare like you know what's the best play here what's the best play there like you know a lot of a lot of things like that so I think it's important to watch your own replays and watch another player's replays and then compare compare yourself to to them and see if you're similar. Nice. Um, how many hours a day do you Dota right now? Would you say? Mm, well, lately, because I've been streaming, mm -hmm. probably like seven hours of pubs. Nice. I just, I usually stream and just play pubs for like six hours, and I try to stream every day. But before that, like before when I was on a team, I didn't play pubs really at all. I just mm -hmm. played scrims, played our matches, and then I didn't want to play Dota anymore. Like, I was done with Dota for that day, and then I would probably just end up watching some games, and then that, that would be it for Dota. So but now you... that I don't have a team, it's basically all pubs. So nice. Well, something can be learned there, I suppose. But uh, so when you said that you like to watch uh, carries that you respect, Twitch chat got a little crazy asking for which carries do you like to watch. Is there one or two carries specifically that you like to watch and steal ideas from? Mm, like about a year ago, it was Loda mm -hmm. when he was on like the TI three Alliance days. Yeah, I watched Loda a lot. And also, let me think. I actually watched Havos too, which is kind of weird because Loda and Havos are like completely different. Mm -hmm. But the reason I watched Loda and Havos was because they were on the two, pretty much the two best teams mm -hmm. or two of the best teams in the world at the time. And they had like really different play styles, which I think was important because I would look at Loda's play and I would look at Havos play and they were both amazing, but you mm -hmm. can see how different they are. So you have to like compare well, what's the benefit of playing like Havost and what's mm. the benefit of playing like Loda? And then you, I kind of found a style that was in between, I would say. Like Loda plays, you know, really hard carries, split push, farm, mm -hmm. and Havost is crazy. And like, <laughs> I kind of I kind of made my play style like a mix in a way. Like, I go for super aggressive plays sometimes, but when I need to, I'll just farm all game long. Right. So it's kind of like, uh, I found a balance, I would say. I like, I like your official assessment of... Uh their different play styles. Loda is uh, late game oriented, slow, steady, split push, and Havost is crazy. So yep. that's a, that's pretty funny that your study assessment comes out to crazy as Havost. So uh, back to the JD Awards. When you found out that you were nominated for best up and comer, and apparently now finding out that you're nominated for the carry position, did you expect the nominations? And how, how ex were you excited at all to find out that you were named? I was actually really excited. Like, I'm just happy that um, I'm recognized by people. Like, mm. I know that for the newcomer, I'm not gonna win. There's no way because Zai is on there. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I know that I'm not gonna win that. But it's like I don't really care about you know, oh, I get to win this and get a prize or whatever. It's like it's more about the fact that people actually recognize me 
as someone who would could be put on something like that and like I am I really um, want to be more known and want to get my name out there more so that was a good thing for me awesome so on a caveat over in twitch chat Jerry B really wants me to tell you that he thinks that you're the best and that you own so uh, kudos to you from Jerry. And I, you know, here, uh, here's an argument, guys, for voting for Usha over Zai. I love you both, but Zai was kind of a big deal back in Han. And uh, yeah. it's not like he's new to MMOs, whereas Usha has only been playing MMOs for, what, three years now? Yeah. So, yeah, a little more of a legitimate up-and-comer to the MMO bracket. So maybe you could spin that as the vote. Um, so you talked about building a team. You're not you're not necessarily going from scratch. You have three if people have a pitch for you, but are you willing to also just go free agent to go solo should the opportunity arise? Uh, yeah, definitely. But I mean, I'm just waiting for opportunities to present themselves. Like, it doesn't matter if it's like the three of us, two of us, one of what, just me. I mean, it, it does matter in a sense that I would prefer to play with them, but I have to in the end. I realized this, I mm -hmm. need to do what's best for me, right. so if there was a really good opportunity and that was just me, I would have to do it, because I need, I, I want to progress myself and become a professional player, and if it means, like, leaving someone behind, I, I mean, I know that they can find opportunities mm -hmm. elsewhere, so Absolutely. I need to just do what's best for me. So, now let me ask you this, would you be willing to do something like move to another country in, like, sort of a black situation? No. No? <laughs> so it's, you, you, you need, you're going to stay in North America? Yeah, I mean, I would play on a European team, but I'm not. I'm not moving there. You're not moving there. All right. So uh, you got North Amer um, European teams. He will play with you. He will do the fear effect. I think it was when fear was playing with. Uh, I forgot who it was, and he had to it was up every single morning at like 3 a.m. to play and practice. <laughs> that poor guy. So you're willing to do that? Um, if you could say one thing to a team that's looking for a carry, what would it be? Like, why would they hire you? Why are you the best candidate for whatever team it is out there right now that just lost somebody with, say, a back injury or a wrist injury and needs a carry to take to the next big land? Why would they pick Ush? Mm, I actually think that I'm, like, a, a really consistent player, like, for being so young and not playing for as long. I think, like... Uh, when it when it comes down to serious games, like I try super hard not to make mistakes. I like I play really uh, s stable, I would say, mm -hmm. and I think uh, I I try really really hard. I I'm like super motivated, so I think I have that going for me that I just care so much about the game and I want to play so badly that I think that's like one of the most important things that you can have. Like if you have five players who just are consistent in their play and really really care. That, that'll bring you really far. Excellent. I like that. Uh, next one up is you have been accruing fans slowly over time. And it's funny when you do <laughs> interviews because you always say, like, if I have fans out there. And you do. Um, I, in fact, I remember when you started your Twitter account, I think I was the second or third follower there. So, nice, nice. Uh, you know, it was fun to watch it grow. And it has grown significantly. What would you say to potential fans? Oh, first off, what do you want to say to your fans who follow you now and are like have seen what's happened over the last year and are looking to where you're going in the future. Oh yeah, it's it's actually awesome though. Like um I actually appreciate like I know everyone says this like, "Oh, shout out to my fans. Mm -hmm. You guys are awesome." But I actually really really appreciate my fans cuz like like I never thought that I would be in a position where I am now. Like I'm not even mm -hmm. in that great of a position, but just to have people that think I'm good, that, mm -hmm. that that like me as a player and that like support me and stuff, it like it's actually really really motivational for me because when I was thinking about like not playing anymore, I thought about like how many people said nice things to me and how many people like want to see me playing and it actually motivated me a lot. So yeah. obviously thank you, but yeah. And that's pretty much it, I would say. And as somebody who's thinking about following you because they may become a fan, why why are you a good person to be a fan of? Why should I watch your stream? Because I'm going to win TI5. Wow. Bold yep. words. Mark yep. it down. I'm going to timestamp that on the Reddit post, by the way, so we can all pull that back uh, when he wins TI5 and be like, New yep. o Oracle just announced not in game in Ush's house. So, uh, nice. That's well, bold. In all seriousness, though, I mean, I think that next year is going to be a really good year for me. Mm -hmm. And I think sometime next year, I'm definitely going to have a strong team. And I want to be like uh, 
an actual North American team that can like contest EG and like mm -hmm. contest for like be a respectable American team. Like right now, there's just SNA and SNA are arguably not as good as EG, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, they can take games off EG, but they're just not on the same caliber right now, mm -hmm. and I want to be, like, on a team where, like, it isn't just EG and then everybody else. It's, right. like, you actually have a team that can represent America that's really, really good. They're not just some, you know, some team. Excellent. Yeah, no, I 100% agree with that. And, you know, you started playing three years ago, and I think when you started playing, nobody really talked about North American Dota at all, really. Uh, we were just sort of a, every once in a while a great player would come up and join a European team. And now we're in the mix for every tournament. Seeing that grow, I think, means a lot to those of us, especially who live here and are big fans of the scene. But a couple of quick Reddit questions for you before we wrap up. Um, Conquer69 wants to know, what do you think of the NA scene? That's a pretty broad question. but it, it, It's always asked. Every time I do an interview, they want to know what pros think of the NA scene. Um... Well, let me think. I miss. Well, let me start with EG. I think EG is like. I think it was inevitable, inevitable that a team like EG would form because, the the professional. Even though there's not a lot of professional players in North America, the ones that there there is are really really good. Mm -hmm. Like, Fear Universe, they're amazing, and they they were always here in America. They were always playing, but they were just, they were like those two players were even on EG, and back mm -hmm. then EG wasn't even like. An amazing team they went to they went to tournaments and they did okay but now eg is like one of the best teams in the world and i think that was inevitably going to happen but but now it's like you, you you need a second one and that's pretty much what my goal is because mm -hmm. like of course there's going to be a team in america that's extremely good eventually but you need to have more than one team to represent america i feel and Absolutely. in terms of the i guess the amateur scene or like mm -hmm. The players who people the people who play N N E L, I think there's always going to be that thing in N A Dota where people have really bad attitudes, and I think a lot of people in N A Dota are pretty like they're definitely skilled, but they just don't know what it takes to be a professional player, and and most of them probably don't even want to play professionally. I feel so yeah. it, it's still going to take a, a while before N A is like really really good, and there's always going to be that like. You know those players with bad attitudes all over the place because it's like it's always been an anecdota and it's it's right. gonna stay i think makes sense um intern inter interner da asks what's your favorite hero to play which hero do you hate and do you have an idol all right my favorite hero to play is tiny okay my least favorite hero is meepo Ugh. And now, now is that not. is that least favorite to play or you hate to see in a game? Both, actually nice. both. I hate I hate seeing I hate playing with it. I hate playing against it. I hate, yeah I hate the hero actually. <laughs> Once I saw a cosplayer dress him and punched him in the face like that visceral. <laughs> or, no, I'm kidding. Uh, who who who's your idol? Who do you look up to in the scene? Or who have you always sort of just been like, man, if I could be that, I'll be that guy. That'd be awesome. Hmm. I don't know, that's tough. I never really thought of someone as my idol in Dota, so... But, I mean, I would say, like, in terms of the storyline, mm -hmm. I want to be, like, Arteezy. Like, I'm not going to say Arteezy's my idol in any way, but, but like, but in terms of how he got where he is, it's, like, really, really awesome. Like, he, mm -hmm. he went from just playing NEL to being on, like, one of the best teams in the world, mm -hmm. and, like, just because he's a really good player, and... I feel like I could do something similar if I was given the chance. So, yeah, I guess that. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, let's see. A Twit Reddit names, man. Come on, guys. A Alien, man ban ma Alien Mana Banana asks, are you dating anybody? No. <laughs> no. All right. Is that just because there's no time for dating within Dota, or is it because it's just, you know, too much work to, to try and go through that process? Mm -hmm. I mean, I had, like... I probably had some opportunities, but I mean, I chose not to because uh, I don't feel that like right now. I feel like I'm in a position where I need to focus on mm -hmm. progressing myself. Yeah. So I, I don't want to 
put time into like another person like that. I, I really need to focus on like getting myself to where I want to be. So yeah, that's pretty much it. So you heard that, guys. He wants to focus on getting where he wants to be. So for all of you prospective teams out there or people uh, looking to hire, he's not even getting a girlfriend because he wants to focus on Dota. <laughs> that's that's pretty boss. So dedication, uh, dedication, dedication 101 coming out of uh, New York right there. Uh, just a reminder, guys, there is only two days left for you to vote on the Join Dota Awards. So you can head over to joindota.com and vote for Ush in the uh, best newcomer and best carry category. Remember, he's only been in the game for three years, so if anybody needs a newcomer uh, prize, it is Ush. And, um, you know, tweet at him, follow him over on Twitter. Where can they find you, Ush? At Ush Dota. Wow. And, my, and my Twitch is Ush Dota, but there's two H's in Ush. It's Ush. Cut. Yeah, Ush Dota, Ush Dota with one H was taken. That Really? Yep, I don't even know how though. It's kind of depressing. And it's not by me either. <laughs> That's a bummer. Uh, so you can find him on Ush Dota at Twitter. You can find him Ush Dota over on Twitch. Uh, obviously, if you think that he's got what it takes, follow. See what he's got planned because I think big things coming for your future. Um, a big thank you guys for being here for the show today. My name's Toffees. You can follow me at Toffees underscore Dota two. You can support the show at Patreon.com slash Toffees. Uh, you can join the Steam chat. It's Coffee W slash Toffees over on steam and of course you can get the show on youtube rss podcast you name it it is there and keep an eye out for the brand new dota fm that we just launched uh so you can listen to all these great games while you're in your car at work or at the gym so i don't know if you knew that us you can now listen to games on an audio only version of the cast so we're pretty excited about that release uh nice. do you have any last words for the folks who are watching or anybody out there in dota land mm. No, I mean, just uh, continue to support me if you do, and that's it. And if you don't, start! Come on! Yeah, exactly. Uh, awesome. Well, thank you, Ush, for being here. We really appreciate it. Thank you to the listeners and the watchers. Anybody who's... If, if you're hearing these words, you're the bomb. Let's just leave it at that. Guys, it was a great show. It was a great afternoon. It was a great... I guess it's evening for some of you. Um, I guess that's it. And as always, have a great night. Play more Dota. And Toffee's out. Thank you.